Hey everybody, Haku here with a special double review big discussion type thing for Tower of God chapters 390 and 391 or season 2 episode 310 and 311. Uh, this actually kind of worked out. So I know in the live reaction yesterday I said I was going to record the review for 390 straight after it and I started doing that and uh, it got interrupted by a bunch of noise outside from a passing train and stuff and I was like you know what screw it I'm just gonna go start uh, start getting the live reaction up for the channel and from there I was like I was struggling a lot with whether I wanted to do this review then and I had a lot on my plate and I was like I, di I didn't know what to do but eventually it came to me I was like you know I can just do a double review I've done that for things before and that could actually kind of work uh, especially if I'm just devoting today, this Tuesday, to just doing this and doing the Boku no Hero Academia anime review that I'm behind on for this weekend. If I'm just focusing on doing both of these things, I can kind of take my time, be a, a little bit loose with this review and this discussion, because there's a lot I want to talk about. We have kind of this, like, transitional area in the story going on between the virtual floor and even the hell train and whatever's coming next because I feel like we're getting off the hell train very very soon like probably near immediately because it's probably going to be attacked by one of Zahard's rankers or something uh, is where I feel like some some foreshadowing and just general feelings are leading me to uh, also there are a ton of comments I want to discuss which is why IQ and I this Thursday. I pushed it back a bunch, uh, or really just pushed it back one week this time. Uh, but that's because I'm behind on comments still. If I haven't answered your comments, don't worry. I'm definitely not ignoring you. And in fact, that's the reason I push stuff back is because I want to answer more comments. I've read all of them. Um, but there are a ton of really good ones that I just haven't gotten around to yet because I get what? I've said before, and this is not complaining because I love answering these comments, they keep me on my toes, and they give me a lot of room to think because some of them are like mini essays and so I look at them and I'm like, okay, in order to respond it's going to take me a good 15-30 minutes to fully respond to this. and. That's a good thing, but at the same time, I'm like, do I really have 15, 30 minutes for this sometimes? So that's why it's just hard to keep up, considering I get, like, from each Tower of God video, a good 10 to 20 per week. Plus, I have all the other things I cover that I'm getting comments like that on, too. Uh, but it's definitely a good thing, because you all always pick up on things that I don't get, or point out if I mess something up, or just give me more reason to think for that extra 15-30 minutes to think about the series and whatever topic it is that you're bringing up. Uh, so I really enjoy those and that's why I wanted to answer all of them and then do a hot Q&A so that I could both credit whoever thought of an idea that I didn't or caught something that I didn't and also to give my own thoughts on it and to, I mean, the whole poison point of the hot Q&A to actually voice that and discuss it with everyone. Um, so that's kind of why I've been behind on that kind of stuff. And uh, there's probably more I wanted to say here in the beginning. Uh, but like I said, I'm just going to take this as more of a loose review discussion of the two of them. I have a little bit of notes for 390, and I thought 390 was good. I liked it. I wasn't super, super hyped, but I did want to talk about it, which is why it sucks that I was a week late on the review. But at the same time, 391 came up, and I wanted to discuss it more immediately, so that's kind of why I wanted to uh, fuse the two together. And I feel like I have a lot more discussion for 391, uh, because going back and rereading it, I really love 391. And sometimes it's hard to be super, super emotive and like really hyped and stuff first thing in the morning, or to catch everything first thing in the morning. Uh, because when I record the live reactions, I usually record it like literally just as I've woken up. So I am still not in like fully on mode, you know? Uh, so, I guess there are things that I don't notice or don't appreciate as much, and then going back and rereading, I appreciate it so much more. And I feel like 391 was that way for me pretty heavily, where when I read it yesterday morning, I was just like, it's, it's pretty alright, it's what it is, it's good. Uh, and there are certain things that I think are good reasons why I felt that way, and I'll get there when I discuss 391 fully. Um, but 
overall rereading it, I feel like I enjoy it. I'll, I enjoy it a lot more now than I did when I first read it. Of course, there are ones that I read that immediately hit me and stick with me, like a lot of uh, Dollar Show. Dollar Show, again, I talk it up so much because it's one of my favorite arcs ever. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to start rereading the series soon because I think I need to reread it and refresh myself on a lot, refresh, <laughs> refresh myself on a lot of stuff. Uh, but in addition to that, I want to do like what was suggested or what was asked of me. Um, which is updated versions of my favorite characters video, my favorite arcs video, now that it's been like two years or two and a half years since I did those videos. Uh, probably nearly that amount. Um, and a lot has changed since then. The list is going to be very different than it was back then because of new arcs and new characters. And uh, I can already spoil you that Dollar Show, if it's not my favorite arc, it's gonna be up there near the top. Um, but a lot of those chapters I remember stuck with me immediately and still stick with me very well. Same with Name Hunt Station. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm kind of getting way off topic. So let's talk about 390 first. I do have my notes that I took last week after reading. Uh, so I'm going to use those to kind of keep me on topic here and refresh me on everything that happened so I don't forget to talk about anything. Uh, so at the beginning we have Macheny's Declaration of War. And we start off the... Uh, the Macheny and Jinsung stuff, which I like more in 390, but I think we got, m or which I like more in 391, but I think we got more of it uh, just panel for panel wise in 390 and time spent on it in 390. But either way, Macheny's declaration of war, we're coming after FUG, and that includes you, Jinsung. Uh, and Jinsung gives a good speech about how the old and powerful live super, super long lives in the tower, and they're very afraid of change. And one thing that he says is that change isn't something for the old to decide. And he has this passing comment of, it's already happening down below, and I feel indirect reference to Bomb, who we know he cares very much for as a student, and he sees Bomb as the one to bring about that change and take down Zahard, and it's not really his place. Machene bringing up, your rage is gone, Shouldn't you have this complete anger and hatred against Zahard that um, you were willing to go against your own family and slaughter a chunk of your own family uh, because of what Zahard did with you and the woman you love and separating you by killing her or whatever? I don't remember the exact backstory here at the moment. I'm sure if I thought about it, I could remember it. Uh, but the basic point of what Macheny was getting at it's not, the details of it aren't important to this uh, argument. Um, the point was that I feel like it's because of his comment that it's not something for the old to decide. It's, he was young and he had that reaction and he went, joined FUG and fought against Zahard uh, and his 10 families or whatever. But now he's reached the point where he's like, it's not my time to do it, it's my disciples' time to do it. I wasn't able to change this tower, but he can, is kind of the feeling that I get from Jinsung, is that Jinsung hasn't lost his rage, he's just decided that he's not the person to decide what change should be, that he's seen Bomb grow when he's been a student, and um, he feels that Bomb is the one that should bring about that change. Um, so then we have the suspend a ship launch an attack. It does nothing. Um, Jinsung uses, uses an attack called uh, Red World that destroys part of the fleet there like it's nothing. Uh, we have deadly weapon number nine out of ten of them that Zahard has. It's called El Rabina it's, and it's an anti-high ranker weapon. I wonder if all ten are similar, if they're all anti-high anti ranker weapons. Uh, but apparently there's ten. Rabina's number nine. And when it first... When I first read this, I was like, he's probably not dead, because uh, it would be a little anticlimactic. Uh, but if CU didn't feel like showing all of this on panel, he could just say that Jinsung died from that in order to progress Bomb's character and his story. Uh, I'm glad he didn't, and we get to see more of Jinsung, and they're making this interaction more detailed. Um, but he could have killed Jinsung there. At least those were my thoughts at the time. Uh, so then Bomb wakes up. Uh, I friggin' love Hockney. We have a little comedy panel with him. I love Hockney as a character. Uh, we learn that Evan is keeping Kun Agro Agnes alive and that his heart is frozen and it must have been like a, uh, it was probably an instinctive thing for Agro Agnes to keep himself alive 
And uh, so yeah, Evan's just keeping him in uh, stasis right now. And Drossy takes Bomb to Beta, and Beta is free now. Uh, they mentioned that the train rules are pretty much gone. The rules have gotten screwy. Uh, and some of the things that I was thinking is that the two big reasons that it could be is either the floor of death is now destroyed and maybe the floor of death w is what was making the rules work what was making the rules uh, uh, what was keeping them in effect what was enforcing them maybe it was the hidden floor so I feel like they should be able to talk about the hidden floor now since it's gone I mean how would it take away their memories if it's destroyed and gone now so I don't know how all that works but the rules are screwy and it could either be that or something that somebody brought up in the comment comments, and I don't remember who. So this will probably be one of those things a lot that I'll have to credit them in the hot Q and A. But somebody brought up that uh, it could be happening because Zahard's family or army, who or whoever's in charge there, has turned off the train or turned off the rules for the Hell Train, so that their high ranker could go in there and destroy everybody that's there, since that's one of Zahard's orders. Um, so that could be another reason that the rules aren't working. But I think those two, it's got to be one of those two. Um, those are the most likely, um, those are the most likely options. A third option that's maybe there is that Rion in 391 says, oh, there's some sort of power that's affecting this. So I was like, maybe it's the Fitbit disrupting the rules. We don't know what the Fitbit actually does if it or how it's a power that can defeat Zahard. Maybe it's a power that breaks rules, and maybe that's a way to get around his invulnerability, um, or his immortality. So I guess you could argue maybe the Fitbit is the thing destroying or distorting the rules. Uh, so maybe that's a third option that 391 brings into the mix. Um, anything else for 390? Oh yeah, we found out that Rack ran after Rachel, so Beta shows the footage of what happened to Bomb, and Bomb goes after them. So uh, to talk about the blog, um, what did what did I write here? Okay, <laughs> sorry, my handwriting is terrible. Uh, but yeah, for the blog, CU says that it's rare for any of the great warriors, the Hard or the Ten Family Heads, to have relationships with people that are beneath them, but. Zahard and Jinsung have this relationship of Jinsung is like, oh yeah, my grandma's friend is the king. So he brings up that Jinsung is actually quite close to Zahard, given that he's a person who has actually had conversations with conversations with Zahard before. I think this is good background lore because it gives us more of Jinsung, Jinsung and Zahard's relationship, and I feel like that's pretty important for Jinsung to show that he's someone who's actually talked to Zahard in person before. Um, or at least presumably in person from the way that he worded it. Um, then Siu said that Kun's life is pretty much the fuse for conflict right now. And I like that because there were some uh, comments that had suggested the same thing. Maybe this is a... or and I had sort of said back, maybe this is a good thing. It's a good thing that Kuno Agaro Agnes can still be a main part of the story without having to have too much screen time and too much development, because he's gotten a ton of development lately where a lot of side characters haven't. Um, it's been him and Androsi other than Bomb getting most of the development, so maybe this could be a chance for other side characters to get plenty of development, but without shoving Kunagro Agnes away from the main story, he's still a main point in the story, even though he doesn't need a bunch of screen time and stuff. Um, so that's actually a really good place for his character. Uh, not near death, but uh, just looking at it story-wise is a good place for his character. Um, and also bringing up, uh, see you said that the relationship may change <laughs> between Bomb and Rachel. And I'm just like, you hear something? I, I have thought this a million times in the past. And this is good going to be a thing that would have been one of the main talking points I would have had for the review of 390 if I would have done it last week right after the chapter is that there have been so many times in the series where it has seemed like okay Bomb is going to be really strict really tough on Rachel now and then he wasn't even though it seemed like he was going to be so when he seems like he's going to be tough on Rachel again it puts me in this mode of okay I'll believe it when I see it 
Uh, so that's kind of where I am with that is, and even after 391, I'm kind of still in that mindset of, okay, maybe he'll be kind of tough on Rachel, but I'll believe it when I see it. Um, I think at the most he might be like asking her, why did you do it? Or what did you do? He's going to be more questioning her. I don't think he's actually going to say, you know, screw you. You are my enemy now. I just don't see that for Bomb. And perhaps that's a good thing, because uh, it's a bit consistent with Bomb's character, and he's a good person no matter how many times he gets screwed over. So maybe, just maybe, it's a good thing that he's like that. But I don't know. I just, I'm not convinced that he's going to be particularly um, tough on Rachel. Uh, also, it was Tower of God's 8th anniversary, which is crazy. It's been going on for 8 years, and last week I did the math when I was thinking about that, and I've had to have been reading, it had to have been like 2012-ish when I started reading, I think. So at least six years ago, if not seven years ago, is when I started reading. So it's crazy how long I've been with the series. And that's what it makes me curious too. Any of you paying attention and listening up to this point, I want to know when a lot of you started reading. Like how far along was the series when you jumped in? Uh, because I remember... Let me try to think if I remember exactly where they were at. When I started reading, I'm pretty sure that season two was like just starting. That season two had like maybe 10 chapters out so far. Uh, and this was back before the line translation was a thing when all we had were fan translations and like uh, the company being the big important one, the good one. Um, and then most of those kind of got hit by copyright strikes a lot, and then eventually when the official Line translation came out, uh, even though Line has been very hit and miss, uh, there was no real need for the fan translations to try to struggle anymore when there was a, an official translation that could support CU in some way. I don't use Adblock on Webtoons or anything, but at the same time, I, I don't remember ever seeing ads. Or maybe I just don't notice them when I'm reading? But yeah, I don't remember ever seeing ads on Webtoons. So how how does Webtoons make money for CU and the others? Because I know other artists who do webcomics have talked about it being an official way to get money for their comics. But, but how if there's no ads? I have no idea how it actually works. Hmm. And I've said that before. I've brought that up before that I have no idea how that actually works. So weird. Maybe there are ads. Maybe I'm just being dumb. Maybe they're at the side and I'm just not paying attention to them. Because I know there's usually something off to the to the right, I think. But I thought that was usually just the the chap... And that's re or reading on desktop. But I think that's usually just the chapter numbers. So, weird. I don't know. Maybe there are ads. Maybe I'm just blinking out. Um, but, uh, yeah, either way. Sorry, that got way off topic. So, yeah, I'm thinking it was around the first dozen or so chapters of season two back in like 2012-ish when I started reading. So I'm wondering when different people uh, jumped in. And of course there have been times when I take like a few months off of reading and then I come back and reread or marathon it or whatever and I've reread the series like seven times so far, maybe even eight times. And I'm going to be rereading again soon because I haven't done so since really early on with the channel, I feel like. I might not have even done it since starting the channel. Um, I'm not quite sure. So it's been a good two years, and there's been a lot that's happened that I've only read basically once and kind of read over again and taken notes on for the review. But either way, I definitely feel like I need a refresher for some of the stuff that's happened in the past two years. Because um, there's a lot I don't remember about some arcs. Especially, it's like, a lot of the floor of death feels kind of like a blur to me at this point. Um, I don't know why the floor of death in particular. I remember Name Hunt Station and the details of that. Same with Dollar Show. A lot more well than I remember a lot of the floor of death stuff. I don't know. Maybe I was just a little bit checked out. Maybe I wasn't super into it. Oh my god, I spit. I hope you didn't see that. Uh, but now that I've drawn attention to it... Uh, Either way. So, uh, yeah, some general thoughts on 390. Uh, I want more info on the deadly weapons. I think I think they're kind of a cool thing. I want to know more about what they are, why they're important. Uh, and maybe 391 gives us some more insight into that. Uh, and what I'm thinking that insight is, is that 
maybe they're just not that important. Maybe they they were just a cool thing to bring in for Jinsung to destroy to make him look even stronger. Uh, and the second thing I had in my notes, I have Bomb Ink Gonna Do Shit uh, written in my notes. Uh, so yeah, that was my thoughts on him and Rachel. Uh, and as a score for 390, I'd give it 7 Deadly Weapons out of 10. I thought it was a good chapter. Um, not that hype or anything, but I thought it was good. Now to talk about 391, and I thought that I was going to talk about 391 a lot more than 390, but damn, I have talked about 390 for like 15 minutes now. Uh, but 391 was great. Like I said, going back and rereading it, I love a lot about it. Uh, but we start off, we have Andrasi and Beta decide to follow Bomb as he goes off to stop Rachel or whatever. Uh, Boro tells Sachi about Bomb waking up and all that, and asks about Misang, and Sachi says that Misang keeps trying to go after Rachel, but he keeps stopping her. And we see Misang's bed, and it looked like somebody was under the covers at first, but maybe that was just a decoy, or maybe that was just me misinterpreting the art. Who knows? Um... Then Warian confronts Bomb in the hall. It's great to see Warian again. Um, a, a very top waifu. And, oh, that reminds me, one of the characters we haven't seen, it's good to see all these characters coming back into play after the virtual floor, but one we haven't seen in a while is Albelda. I guess she's still off in whatever room she was hiding in while they were on the floor of death is when she went into hiding. Um, so, yeah, it's been a while since we've seen Albelda. Uh, then, uh, yeah. Oh, Warian says that ever since they got back on the train from being on the virtual floor, the rules have been all screwy, so now she can see the pads even on the train. Uh, so yeah, I talked about the three reasons I think that the rules could be all screwy, and since it's ever since they got back, it kind of leads into it could be any of those three things still. It could be because of the Fitbit, it could be because Zahard's family took the rules off so they could send a high ranker in there to attack, or thirdly, it could just be because the floor of death is, or the virtual floor is destroyed. I keep accidentally saying floor of death when I'm meaning virtual floor, so I hope I always catch myself, but uh, just know what I mean if I mess up. Um, then, uh, what am I thinking here? Uh, <laughs> uh, Andrasi says that she partially that she partially blames herself for Kunagru Agnes' situation, which I love. We're getting a lot of good development for Andrasi, and I think her character's come a long way just in the past few arcs. Uh, Name Hunt Station was a good arc for her and her character, but the Virtual Floor, even though it was kind of multiple arcs, uh, the Virtual Floor was very good for Andrasi's character. And even since then, she's carried a lot of that development with her, and it's been helping a lot with her character, I think. Whereas before, she was a good character, whatever. But ever since the Virtual Floor, we get a lot more into her motivations, and more importantly, her insecurities. And seeing a character as strong as Andrasi's insecurities is really, really cool. And it reminds me of some of the stuff we got glimpses of in Volume 1. So I like that a lot. And like I said in the live reaction even, it has made me like Andrasi's character a lot more lately. Um, and she also tells Bomb, you can't beat Joaquin alone, who you kidding? You need me and Beto, you need somebody to help fight Joaquin, because Rachel and Yura are going to be there too, and they're not exactly pushovers. Also, now that I'm thinking about it, we didn't see Traveler this chapter, but there are a lot of times when we just don't see Traveler, so he's wherever, I guess. I'm actually kind of excited for Kasuno and Horyang to come back. That'll be pretty interesting. More for Horyang? And what his relationship with Kasuno is going to be like now? But just this whole... This whole sort of issue of Prince and Akraptor being dead is kind of big. And we're going to get into that at some point. It could affect what Bomb's going to do here. Uh, but I think maybe I'll talk about that towards the end. Because it might fit better there. Uh, instead of cutting in here with it. But there's a lot that the characters need to talk about. That I hope we... I hope we get some of here before they get interrupted, because I have a strong feeling they're going to get interrupted. Um, so then what happens from there? It, oh, and I also like the way that Joaquin is still being presented as being very, very strong. Because logically, even with all his new abilities, Bomb and Joaquin are pretty close in strength. I would even say that 
in a normal situation, Joaquin is probably stronger. It's just that Bomb got lucky when he fought him that it wasn't a normal situation, that he was able to take advantage of the soul power up. And even though Bomb has gotten stronger still since then, it's not a certainty that he would be able to beat him. Um, so uh, from there, uh, we go back to Jinsung, and I loved this stuff here with Jinsung and Masheni. Uh, even though it wasn't as much as last chapter, I feel like I liked it more than last chapter. Uh, but Jinsung just tanked the anti-high-ranker weapon. Uh, he tanked it head-on, and then he smashes it with a kick, and Masheni prepares to fight him. And that's all we get, but I was really excited by that and thought it was really cool. Uh, especially, it makes me think that the high-ranker weapon might have just been invented and brought in uh, by CU, basically just to give him a reason to look cooler and look stronger to say, oh, here's this really important thing, and then he just smashes it. Uh, to make him look stronger and make him look cooler. So that makes sense. Uh, we cut back and Misang is watching Rachel from above in the roof. Uh, Yura wants Rachel to move somewhere safer, get out from out in the open, but Rachel is in despair thinking that she lost. Thinking, oh, I didn't beat Bomb in this competition, even though technically she kind of did. Um, and also thinking, oh, I hate my stupid ugly body, even though this Rachel body is more attractive than the Icarus body and she's despairing because she didn't get those powers but I don't want to repeat myself too much because I've said this like every time she has brought it up but those powers should not work outside of the uh, outside of the virtual floor anyway um, so this leads to some deeper stuff because she's saying I want you don't know what it's like to be like to not be pretty and not be fond over and I want to go, I want to leave Arlen. It's just kind of weird. It's really hinting at a lot of deeper stuff for her character. Because we've seen her say things like this before. And it just makes you think, what is the connection between all that? Um, so that's interesting. I saw one theory that maybe Icarus was supposed to look like Arlen. Maybe? I don't know. I don't really picture Arlen looking like that, though. I guess you could say Arlen did look like that, and Bomb just doesn't look a thing like Arlen, but I'd like it if Bomb and Arlen looked more like one another. Though I think they're kind of setting up things for Bomb to take more after V than Arlen. Uh, except for when it comes to fighting style. He definitely has the, uh, the spellcaster type fighting style, and now with the orb, he's going to be even more like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, where, where on earth does that leave me in all this mess of notes? Uh, yeah, Yura wants to move Rachel somewhere, but Rachel's too deep in despair. Rack finally finds them. He goes big in his clothes rip, which is weird, because has that ever happened before? I feel like normally when he compresses, his clothes compress with him. And when he goes big, his clothes go back to being big with him. Did he just forget and put on a non-compressed pair of clothes this time and then decompress and tear them all off uh, but it was kind of weird it was different I was like that hasn't happened before uh, at least to my knowledge um, then Misang prepares her ambush but she gets found by Joaquin leading to some really cool panels Joaquin's new outfit I wasn't sure how I was feeling it at first but it's kind of cool um, but then he's going to eat her soul uh, and then a really cool sequence was when he just senses it and turns around and slices the needles thrown by Andrasi. That's just really, really cool. And it's cool seeing Andrasi use needles again. Because like I said, I don't think we've seen that since since Volume 1. I don't remember seeing her use needles since then. Um, and Rion is also with Andrasi. Not sure where Beta is. I guess Beta is going to be with Bomb. Um... And Andrasi and Rion are going to be the ones trying to take on Joaquin, which is going to be a, a cool pairing, I think, uh, or a cool matchup, so to speak. Um, then Bomb launches an attack between Rack and Rachel, separating them, and he has his, he's not in the burnt chestnut form, but he still uses the blue ore wings, which is really cool, uh, that we have this new version of blue ore that he can just use whenever. Um, so yeah, it has me thinking he's probably going to be asking Rachel questions and kind of like fighting against her because she'll be launching attacks at him but I don't feel like he's going to be trying to particularly hurt her like Rack or anything because of 
the way he just sort of split the attack in the middle, he didn't just go straight off and attack her directly or anything. Um, so yeah, I think he's going to be more just wanting answers than actually trying to take her down or anything. And another thing that kind of... I, I can bring it up now, I think, is the best place, is can me saying, tell Bomb, yo, she killed Akraptor, just shout it to him and try to get him enraged or pissed off to actually attack her? Is he going to find out about Akraptor and Prince here? Who knows? Or is it, like I said, in the reaction, a possibility that he lets her go for now, and then me saying's like, why did you do that? She killed Prince and Akraptor. And then he's like, oh man, I'm going to get her next time. And then next time something else will come up and he won't. Um, and that's another thing that I think, I put it in my general notes, but I can just bring it up here, is we're getting all these pairings that are really cool. And I feel like I should be super, super excited but there's this reason that I wasn't, and I brought this up way earlier in this video, this is turning kind of long, but I brought this up way earlier in this video where there are reasons that I don't feel like I'm as hyped as I should be maybe, and that's because we've seen things like this before. We've seen Bomb's team and Rachel's team square off and all these different matchups, but each time it happens, Rachel's team either runs away or something interrupts them every single time. So we never get to see full-on fights. That's why I'd be super excited if we were going to see full-on fights, but I am not convinced we're going to get a full-on Andrasi versus Joaquin fight. Not convinced we're getting full-on Bomb versus Rachel fight. Uh, I think what is most likely here is whoever was sent by Zahard or the army or whatever to kill everybody on the Hell Train I thought of it in the live reaction, and the more I've thought about it, the more I can absolutely see it happening. Whoever is sent to kill everybody on the Hell Train is going to show up, and Bomb's group is going to have to work together with um, Rachel's group, at least to survive to get off the Hell Train. So the Hell Train will be ending very, very soon, because they're going to have to get off of there quickly. Uh, and there could be somebody else that comes in and saves them. They could be saved by, we still don't know where Karaka and Wengnen are. Karaka could save them because he's like, you're, you're my enemy, but you're my enemy, not theirs. You're my prey. So we might end up saving them because we know Karaka's a very much a zealot for FUG. So he's like, you know, if the Zahard family wants to take out Juvial Grace, I need to protect Juvial Grace because it's in the best interest of FUG. Uh, which is, in turn, my best interest. Uh, so Karaka could end up teleporting them out of there using the black orbs. We don't know quite how his power works. Uh, but I guess that's a possibility. Or they could all team up to escape. One thing that I saw somebody say that would be really cool is they were like, we could see a high ranker or a ranker come in to attack them all, and they can't handle a ranker or high ranker, even all working together. But... Unless, I guess, if they have Yuri, Yuri obviously probably could, depending on how strong a ranker it was, or Evan. Evan's very strong. But one thing that I saw that was very cool was they were like, what if Albelda shows up and is like, I've got a fuse with Joaquin, so they fully fuse White back together in order for White to be the one to get them all off the train, because he would be able to stand against a high ranker, arguably, if he was full Slayer mode. Um, but again, we don't know how that works, because now that the souls are gone, I don't think he would be high ranker level. Me personally. I mean, that's a possibility, but I think now that the souls were transferred to Bomb, and the souls aren't there anymore, the power's been all used up, I feel like even fusing Albelda into Joaquin to make the complete white again, um... I don't think White is going to be high ranker level. Because we know even right now, even though White is probably the strongest of this group right now, even stronger than Bomb, arguably, we've seen CU say that Bomb isn't ranker level. He's a third of the way there. Uh, ranker Bomb is going to be, and ranker anybody, is completely different from a regular just one third of the way up the tower. Um, so again, I feel like 
even fusing together and completing white, he might not even be ranker level. Uh, he might be like person halfway up the tower level or person two-thirds of the way up the tower level. But I'm not sure he's going to be full-on ranker. So maybe that's a possibility, maybe not. Uh, but either way, I should talk about the blog. I kind of uh, got all out of order here. But in the blog, um, Sue said that this chapter and the story that's going on right now is kind of bridging the virtual floor stuff with the ending of the train and what's coming next. So I think that's really cool, and I think this is a really good arc so far, just to be a bridging, connecting thing. Um, then he says that this is going to be some time used to explore characters and their relationships, and specifically he mentions Rachel, Baum, and Joaquin. So I guess Baum and Rachel, obviously, uh, but Joaquin as well. Look forward to developments with them. Uh, CU says that he likes every character. He says it's often brought up, how do you like certain characters? Like, he always brings up how much he likes Rachel as a character. But he says that he likes every character that he writes, but he writes them in a way where he's like, this is their past, this is their personality, what actions are their past and personality going to make them take? And the fans get to decide for themselves whether they think those actions are good or evil, justified or not justified, uh, good or bad. Um, he just writes the decisions that he thinks they would make and then lets the fans decide whether they think they're good or bad. So I think that's really cool. Uh, and it it's a lot more depth because while Rachel is an absolute ass, she has her reasons for it. Uh, and she's a very deep character, I think a very good antagonist. Because to make such a large portion of the fan base hate the character so much, that means they're a good villain. Um, at least in Rachel's case. I guess that's probably a blanket statement that isn't always necessarily true, because the fans could hate them because they're a bad villain. But Rachel's objectively a very good antagonist, and a very good antagonistic rival for Bomb. Uh, and then lastly in the blog, he says that Masheni and Jinsung just fighting half-heartedly is a huge scale, and that Masheni has another objective in mind. So, or it seems like that. So I guess we'll get to see whatever that's going to be later on. Okay. Uh, so yeah, thoughts on the chapter. I really loved it. I think it's great to see a lot of the characters again, like Misang and Wariun. Uh, and I hope we get to see a lot of good things with them. I hope that Joaquin being important again... Uh, is really good because Floor of Death and Virtual Floor Joaquin was important but not as important as like Bomb and Rachel getting most of the focus and even arguably Agar Agnes and Androsi getting more focus uh, and especially Floor of Death was like it was a ranker arc really we barely focused except for Bomb's backstory we barely focused any on any of the regular characters. It was all about like Yuri and Mazano and Hell Joe and such. Um, so, uh, yeah, am I forgetting anything here? Nah, and um, I think I did bring this up before. One thing I put in my notes is I would be more hype if I thought we were getting real full fights, but I think that a team up is very much possible. I think there's going to be somebody coming in that will interrupt all of this. Um, and maybe they'll have to team up to survive, or maybe they'll just escape via Karaka or some other method, um, or maybe they'll just run away in general, but I think somebody's going to be coming to interrupt this. Probably the attacking high ranker. Um, and I just thought, it's not my notes or anything, I just thought while recording this, that Karaka stuff, and I think that's actually pretty good. I'd like to see something like that. Uh, so a score for this one, I get eight. 8.25 revenges out of 10. There's a lot of different revenges going on right now. Revenge for Prince and Akrapt or revenge for Agro Agnes. Um, yeah, 8.25 out of 10. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed both of these in hindsight. Um, maybe I enjoyed 390 more than I thought. I knew I liked it, but maybe I liked it even more than I originally thought. Uh, but yeah, either way, I hope you enjoyed the video. So, like if you did like the video. And comment down there to tell me what you thought of these two chapters and my thoughts on them. Uh, subscribe for more Tower of God and much more on the channel. Follow on Twitter if you want, and I can try to keep you updated there and stuff for the channel. And if you want to link to our Discord server to talk to me or more of us there, uh, just ask and I'll give you a link to the Discord server. Yeah, mouth's getting really dry. I've been talking for like 40 minutes straight. 
Uh, so yeah, that's it. I think I said everything I need to say. Uh, so thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.